Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrs. And joining us is Will Duffield. He's a researcher with Cato's First Amendment Project. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Will. Good to be back. What is Cambridge Analytica and what have they done with my data? <laughs> so Cambridge Analytica is a political consulting firm and we aren't perfectly sure what they've done with your data. Now, to start, this is a story full of unreliable narrators, um, has some confusing twists and turns, and a lot of those with access to privileged information in this story have a whole host of incentives to misrepresent what they know. Um, the basic story of the Cambridge Analytica Facebook data scandal is that a researcher named Alexander Kogan back in 2013 used Amazon's Mechanical Turk service to hire individuals with Facebook accounts to take a personality test which under Facebook's rules at that time also allowed him access to a basic set of information about these test takers' friends. So this is one of these tests that you sign into the test online with your Facebook account to answer silly questions and then it posts the results to your Facebook which, feed. Which uh, Harry Potter, Hogwarts house are you kind of thing? Yes, that sort of thing exactly. Um, this data was then contrary to Facebook's terms of service sold by Alexander Kogan to Cambridge Analytica. They may have used some of this data, both information from the test takers and information about the test takers' friends, to create psychographic profiles used to potentially more effectively target political advertisements. So this, as you've described, it sounds like much less of a big deal in terms of scope than the headlines have said. So we're talking about some people five years ago who took a personality test. So how do we get from that to the like hundreds of millions of Facebook users data has been exposed? A couple hundred thousand people took the test and each of them had a few hundred friends. So initially it was expected that 23 million Facebook users might have had that simpler set of data, uh, the friends data pulled and incorporated in this data set. Um, there were a number of other tests that Kogan had run around the same time, which is how we get the revised number of potentially 87 million accounts and affected. What kind of data do they have was in this bundle that they managed to gather both on – so there's data from the people who took the test and then there's data about the friends of the people who took the test, but what's in that data? So that will include who your friends are, um, your age, employment status, some location data. This is what you've chosen to post about your location. Your hometown not, or where yes, you went to high school. Not um, data gleaned from cell phone records. Things you like, would that be in the data? Certainly, so, um, yes. So, I mean, the theory Pages here- Pages you've liked. Yeah, the theory here is that you could, I mean, this would be advertisers in general. You could use that to figure out that if you liked uh, some page for, I don't know, buck hunting enthusiasts, they might want to advertise some some shotgun shells. Or you don't, well, actually, yeah. you don't hunt deer with a shotgun. Uh, you uh, advertise some riflery equipment. Um, but. And that's what it seems pretty innocuous. Uh, and Cambridge Analytica was a political consulting firm, uh, and they used it for that purpose. And Ted Cruz had used it before Donald Trump did, correct? Yes. Um, though I believe Ted Cruz's contract was originally with SCL Group, um, which is a larger parent firm which has done uh, much more government and even military work in the past. Um, there's another firm in the mix under this SCL umbrella called Aggregate IQ, which was more heavily involved in Britain's uh, Brexit vote leave campaign. So, so, I mean, my my first reaction is 
so what? That, that was my first, when I heard about this, I, I said, okay, so what? Um, uh, is that a good general reaction to have? Or, or is it's there, always, is no matter the, what I mean, the situation yeah, saying, is. Nah, yeah, it's okay. But, or is it something that was opening up a discussion that is going to be with us for a long time? I would say when it comes to this specific instance, um, how this data scraped by Kogan might have been used in elections, it is a sort of so what response. Um, I think a lot more of this has been going on as well that we don't know about, but this poked above the surface, we've latched onto it, and because they're a global firm, they were involved in elections both in the US and in Europe, um, it's been easy for all sorts of people to see a niche story that applies to them within this broader concern. Now, it does presage a sort of concerning state of affairs when it comes to data in general how and how it's used. However, a lot of that contingent concern is also reliant upon your theory of political communication. You said this was – what was done here was against Facebook's terms of service. So you can so Facebook would give this data to a third party, in this case the the guy running the quiz, but you weren't allowed to then pass that data on to yet another party? Yes. And when we talk about giving data, for the most part, it was it's the app itself that's collecting that data. It's not so much Facebook. Facebook provides the platform for it, sets the rules governing apps in general, what they can pull. But the users are then authorizing the specific application they're using um, to gather this data. So when the user went to take the quiz, they had to click through something that said, do you want to share all of your data with this third party? And they said, sure. Yes, including the friend's data. So Zuckerberg goes to Congress, who seemed to be quite upset about Everyone this. Everyone flipped out about this. And uh, what, you, you, I think, watched all that or, or most of it. Uh, Mercifully, yes. <laughs> uh, well, I saw some of the highlight reels going around, but but what would be the if you're having sat through the whole thing? What, what would be your description of that uh, bizarre event? Ignorant. <laughs> um, the most prominent misconception displayed in those hearings seemed to be that when Facebook advertises on someone else's behalf. The advertiser is, in the minds of many congresspeople, gaining a tranche of data from Facebook to use for its own advertising purposes. Um, that's not the case. Um, when you seek to post an advertisement on Facebook, pay them to spread a message, you choose an audience within Facebook, a sort of people who you would like to reach, and then they, using the data that they have on us, um, serve that advertisement to these populations. So it's not that it's it's again, it's somewhat new in the sense that we have more data about people than ever before, but it's also just. Uh, running ad, I mean, we've, all, we've always run ads. Uh, we've tried to avoid showing ads to people who don't care about them. That's pretty right. difficult. This you know. is, it's just a more sophisticated version of saying like this television show is popular in the 18 to 34 demographic of men with incomes of certain amounts. So I'm going to target in quotes that audience by advertising in front of that TV show. Yeah, I remember uh, when I was a kid and watching Saturday morning cartoons and and. Uh, always going to my parents and being like, "Have you seen that commercial for you know this new playset?" And like, "No, we haven't seen that commercial." And I was like, what? "How could you have seen it? It's on. It's on every every and, time. It's always on." And if your parents were watching along with you, the money spent to serve an ad to them was rather wasted. Yeah, uh, there's an inefficiency there. So, it's, it's like the, it's like why I, the NFL, for some reason, decides that the only thing that should be advertised in NFL games is pickup trucks. And enlisting in the Navy and, and erectile dysfunction. Yes, and Budweiser. Um, none of which are necessarily anything I would consider 
so, buying. Or, yeah. So what, where where are we now? If this is the nature of the modern world, and people seem to understand that. Um, I mean, I think people understand that a lot of data is kept on them by a bunch of corporations. I think they don't actually care that much, which we could talk about. They should, um, and they use that data, and so will politics. So, so, it, but it, is there more to this in terms of like? Well, I mean, going forward, there'll just be more data and more specific data, and it could be you know where were you at Thursday at six o one p.m. or whatever. Um, and so, does it get creepy at some point? Well, I think there is certainly a sort of civic Republican concern that accompanies the use of targeted advertising in politics. If your neighbor is receiving different cola commercials than you, no real reason to care about that. If advertisements are you political advertisements are used not just to convince but to inform and increasingly our electorate lives in different information spaces, we can see a concern there, but that also comes along with the usual individual choices of people to consume different sorts of partisan media. So it isn't a new concern, but it might be magnified by this. And what about Russia? That's the other one we, the, uh, the one that manipulated, I'm putting that in scare quotes, manipulated our, particular, our political processes uh, with via Facebook. What did Russia do? Russia ran fewer political advertisements in doing this in attempting to interfere. They weren't necessarily what you would think of as an electioneering communication. They were mostly instead designed to provoke partisan or tribal fears. Um, things like Sharia law coming to a community near you or on the other side um, discussing police brutality against African Americans. Um, so they, they don't fall within what we would think of as political communications, but they were definitely designed to heighten tensions that already existed within the American electorate. And they often aped the style of some of the most inflammatory voices in our polity. I'm trying to understand the privacy concerns here. The, I mean, because clearly the response to this story, it's clear that a lot of people think we've already gone way across the creepy line. Um, and, and Congress thinks that we've gone across the line that upset them in a way that the Snowden revelations didn't. Um, but, but so bracket the question of um, <clears throat> when Facebook five years ago was allowing apps to scrape this data, um, which it sounds like they They've restricted that. They nixed that in 2014. Right. So that's not that's not a thing. So so the data is being gathered and aggregated by Facebook, and it's being kept in Facebook servers. And so this is why the you know the hip thing a couple of weeks ago was to go to the Facebook page where you could download all your data and then dig through it and be astonished at how much you being on Facebook six hours a day generates. Uh, but but Facebook, as we said, is not they're not sharing that data on an individual basis in any way like with with outside firms, they're just saying like if they know that you happen to be a certain age and they know that you happen to like certain things and so if someone says, I want someone of a certain, I want people of a certain age and people who like the following things to see this ad, Facebook will just marry them up. But but is the concern then that the data, you know, from like a personal privacy issue that it could get off of Facebook servers, that Facebook could get hacked or are people concerned by the very nature of this aggregating? That's a concern. but. It does go to the aggregating and it involves Facebook and even the internet less than we might expect. Um, the fact of the matter is there are a host of interactions which create data which prior to the past decade or so was very difficult to capture and organize. You're having purchased something at Target or buying a certain insurance policy couldn't be brought together into some kind of cohesive whole picture of your life. That's changed now. So a host of things we do on a daily basis which previously couldn't be very well tracked now contribute to a mosaic of our lives and I think that is uncomfortable for many people. Do you think that that discomfort 
So like as a libertarian, I am uncomfortable with the notion that that kind of data exists in a silo somewhere. Even if Facebook's not giving it away, Facebook is still exists within the territories of states that would love to get their hands on that data often to do bad things to people who are not necessarily fans of that state. Uh, and that makes me uncomfortable because this is you know access to something that looks very much like incredibly pervasive surveillance. Um, but from the the private end, is there? I mean, if Facebook's just using this to give us targeted ads, and I, I think everyone would admit that, on the whole, m more targeted ads are better than less targeted ads, just from the u the user experience. Yeah, I'm tired of that cars for kids commercial. If we could, you know, target sure. something more salient to my interests, that would be an improvement. Uh, so, what's the what's the privacy concern? Outside of just like I feel this is feel like this is creepy. Is there like you know, call it from our libertarian perspective? Is there like a genuine privacy concern here, beyond that states might get this data? I would say there still is, particularly when one's expectations concerning how this collected data can be used to discipline them are at odds with the extent of that reality. Um, if you used to have an Ashley Madison account but didn't think that that was the sort of thing that a coworker could find out about and use to push you into taking on some assignment at work, well, finding out that it can and they will is discomforting. Um, it alters the ways in which we might comfortably interact with the world around us. How much do you think the uproar about both Cambridge Analytica and Russia in, in this specific uh, Facebook and Russia is related to relitigating the 2016 election? Oh, very much so. Um, now, I, I don't think that either the Cambridge Analytica scandal or Russian involvement here or even work that AQI did on the Brexit campaign altered the outcomes of those elections. However, the ability for uh, effectively marginalized groups within our polity to use social media writ large um, probably had a very real impact on the election. So Cambridge Analytica and Russia are used as a proxy for that broader concern that these voices are coming out of the woodwork and there doesn't seem to be a very good way to hush them up again. But what's the problem with that? I mean, what's the problem with more voices coming out of the woodwork? Is it that- They might be Alex Jones. I think that's what they some might people be Well, and that in yeah. this case, yeah. they voted for Trump. Yes. Right. But but these are, I mean, we, we've always had candidates have bought ads all the time and we don't have a problem with that and political parties buy ads all the time and government officials campaign all the time. And you've uh, had organizations like, uh, what is that guy's name, David Icke? Yes. Uh, the, the, everyone, the lizard people. The lizard. I mean, he's been putting out stuff forever about that, right? Right. So I, I guess I just, I have a hard time feeling the weight of the concern that lots of prior marginalized voices are getting their say. I mean, I get that a lot of these marginalized voices are crazy, um, but that just seems to be more a problem of like, why are so many Amer Americans susceptible to believing crazy stuff. Um, but I don't I don't know that they're necessarily like these voices are more dangerous than hearing your local politician tell you to do something. Yes, and there's certainly no just reason for depriving these people of access to contemporary telecommunications technology. I think that the the issue is and I've talked about it before on Free Thoughts and episodes that we talk about campaign finance in particular that if you don't understand why people disagree with you um, and, and there's something we'll, we can get, we'll get into bubbles and stuff like that too and, and but if it is the case that if, if you have no good story for why someone disagrees with you except for they, they must be duped by something and I think there's some evidence that says that we, we mi misunderstand the other side more than we, than we used to, to to some extent. And so therefore you need to have an explanation for why this thing happened like Donald Trump's election 
and we were really explaining other people's political beliefs and trying to come up with some sort of reason why that they believe these things. And that's what's scary to me. That's what I realized when I saw this Cambridge Analytica thing, that this is the new campaign finance. This is the new Citizens United discussion. The worry about the corporations was always that they would have so much political power to run ads that they, they would convince people to vote against those people's interests. I'm putting that in scare quotes and for the corporate interests. And so we're afraid of, you know, any of these terms here, like someone's corrupting our democracy or like we have Cambridge Analytica corrupting our democracy or corporations corrupting our democracy. And that always makes me just think interesting because I'm like, okay, corrupting. So how is speaking to people corrupting a democracy? And there's so many implicit premises in that. Uh, and I think we're, that's what we're getting into with this uh, Facebook stuff. Yeah. Where you draw the line as to what is endogenous versus exogenous to one's democracy uh, tells you a lot about their theory of political communication, That's the legitimacy of different forms of messaging or messengers. There's some sort of line from influence to brainwash, right? And it runs through manipulation in the middle. Uh, and so you say, okay, you're, you're allowed to influence the electorate and you can get out there and make your voice heard, and, but you can't brainwash them and manipulation is probably too far too. And so I think that they, they would probably put the people who are afraid of Cambridge Analytica and future of this, they'd probably put it at manipulation. And they're probably worried that if the data gets good enough, it could go to brainwashing where they have some sort of algorithm that says, if you wash your car every Tuesday and you buy kumquats and you'd like to play squash, we just have to show you six things, um, like a koala bear video and then like a video of Donald Trump and then this, and then you will now vote. Like we'll crack your brain, like some sort of, you know, combination to a safe. And I think, you know, that's very sci-fi, but that's somewhat what people are also worried about. I think it is, but especially in the political realm, I feel as though those fears are presently overblown. Um, when it comes to Cambridge Analytica in particular, there's very little evidence that any of this worked or even was perceived to work by certain campaigns that hired Cambridge Analytica. You look to Cruz's use of them. He was doing it because they were the Mercer's data analytics firm. Um, Robert Mercer funded Cambridge Analytica. He also funded a number of GOP campaigns this past election cycle. And one way in which you could signal goodwill towards him and ask for his money was by hiring Cambridge Analytica. Um, when it comes to their actual services, I was uh, supposed lucky enough to receive a sales pitch from them about a year and a half ago. I'd been working for a cannabis policy magazine in the UK that was looking to begin a legalization campaign. And one of the firms we had in to discuss uh, potentially working on this campaign was Cambridge Analytica. Um, they played up what uh, they could do, a sort of slick monorail salesman-esque pitch. But at the end of the day, it relied on a great many gimmicks, um, posting a bounty for or running a competition for whoever could correctly guess both the score and the two teams involved in the Premier League final. If you want to find potential Brexit voters, uh, seems like a pretty good way to go about it. But it doesn't speak to the efficacy of your underlying algorithm or use of data. It's just a clever idea to select for mid 40-something white men and get them to give you their email address and some other info. Is there any way that we could measure the efficacy of it? I mean, if ultimately what you're trying to do is influence votes and votes are not public, you know, we don't have, we don't have records that you can look at. We know X number of people from this area voted um, and we know how the, the totals came out, but we don't know that this guy voted this way unless he tells you. Can, is it always going to be just kind of that monorail sales pitch or would it be possible to say, look, we, you know, through what we've done, we moved the popular vote, you know, 0. 0.0 whatever percent? I think it's difficult, um, maybe not impossible in certain cases, but you rarely get the chance to rerun an election while only tweaking one variable. 
And in order to really drill down into the efficacy of this, you need to be able to do that. I want to get to the uh, the government's response to this and and the the proposals that have been put forward to fix this problem. Um, but before we do, this has provoked a lot of soul searching in Silicon Valley, um, and then and and a lot of you know talk about privacy and and I don't know if it's related to this stuff or if it's related to the the recent changes in European privacy regs. But like just over the last several days, I've gotten notices about our privacy policy from basically every internet service that I have signed up for. Um, so this stuff is in the air. What what are people in Silicon Valley seeing as like, well, so first, does Silicon Valley recognize this as a problem or, or think this is a problem? It might not be a problem, but do they think it's a problem? Um, and then what are their kind of self enforced solutions that they imagine? So when it comes to Silicon Valley's perception of their role in this, I think it's even broader than simply a data privacy issue, but a growing recognition that they will be treated and must behave as a sort of political actor. Their power has been recognized and now they have a bunch of people lining up at the door asking for various dispensations and threatening different sorts of regulations if they don't get what they want. Um, so this is an emerging awareness. When it comes to what firms have done in response to this, it's been fairly robust, particularly when it comes to this Facebook Russia question. Um, Russia used Facebook groups in many cases, very large pages uh, to spread their messages, uh, trying to come off as American citizens of different political bents. Uh, they're requiring in order to run both explicitly political ads but also just any kind of more general issue ad that falls within a laundry list of political categories um, or to run one of these large pages. These are pages with X number of followers. And these were all like they were, they were those like America great or uh, uh, things like this, patriotic sounding, yes. vague, uh, make America wonderful now kind of thing. But going forward, and this is supposed to be rolled out before the 2018 midterms, in order to do any of that, you'll need to verify your identity, that you are an American citizen or have uh, some form of government issued ID and you'll actually receive a code in the physical mail that you then punch in online and then you've been verified. This Shouldn't is what Facebook has announced for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't we be kind of flattered and grateful that Russia wants to make America great again? <laughs> I mean, they're just trying to help out. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, you know, we could, we could use some help. Um, so this, uh, this is like how recently did they announce this, Facebook? This was pretty recently. Pretty recently. Yeah. Um, it had been in the works for a time. They're also, and this will be fascinating for all of the DC political wonks, going to keep track, keep a publicly accessible database of all political advertisements run by all campaigns. So you will know, you'll be able to go on and look at both what might have been run to you, but also ads designed to target very different sorts of people from yourself. But this will be open and accessible to everyone. It makes sort of sneaky A-B ad testing much more difficult. I'm sure some people will be rather frustrated about that. But um, this is an action the government certainly couldn't take, but that Facebook as a private company has decided to do. What about on the broader just creepy data mining and aggregation level. Um, I mean, so one one question I guess would be, 
is that stuff is the you know we're just going to gather data like all of the data about everything that you do on on our platform um, and also on every website that's you know interfacing with our platform and whatever else is that like necessary to the kind of very business model of these free mega platform sites could we have facebook without creepy facebook data gathering you could if you wanted to pay for it whether that market exists i'm not so sure how real is the threat of regulation do you think i mean maybe not even in the near term uh, regulating facebook or twitter or something like this but but in the long term too you know we're in the as you and i have discussed uh, uh, privately we're in the baby steps of the internet and of social media and the world in 50 years will I, mean, I assume social media is not going away due to the sort of human element of it um, you know will we will will we have to be constantly aware of sort of calls for regulation because I'm thinking about comparing it to something like the FCC right where we had a fairness doctrine until 1987 that, that on the theory that the limited airwaves and if you just put one side of the of the conversation up uh, you had to put the other one because that's how we sort of sculpted our political speech framework so people could be informed of both sides. Uh, do you think that there's a possibility that something like that or totally something different could come with uh, Facebook and other yet to be seen social media? I, I'm certainly concerned about the threat of regulation going forward. Um, CDA 230 has created a pretty good and what is that? You have to pretty define strong. That. Uh, CDA 230 is an element of the Communications Decency Act and pretty much the only element that survived later judicial review, it prevents platforms or content hosts from being held liable for content posted by others. If you have a hand in making the content, it doesn't apply to you. But as long as you're just up or down voting what others create, um, you know, someone libels someone in your comment section. They can't go after you. They can go after the person who posted the libel, but you as a host are insulated. And it's really the substrate on which the modern internet has been built. Without it, you couldn't run a platform like Facebook because you'd be sued out of existence. Um, however, while that's created a pretty strong presumptive norm um, in favor of allowing platforms to govern themselves, you are seeing it nibbled at around the edges, um, particularly in areas in which there's an ugliness to what may be happening on the internet. We saw FOSTA passed recently, which carved out a little section, um, cutting away at these 230 protections for sites that are seen to knowingly promote sex trafficking or prostitution. Hard to be against an anti-sex trafficking bill, but in its effect, uh, you begin to expose platforms and particularly up and coming platforms to liability for things frankly beyond their control. Um, on the advertising front as well, it looks as though Facebook's move and Twitter as well to privately rein in their political advertising markets have at least immediately forestalled regulation. But some form of the Honest Ads Act will probably move forward in the future simply in an attempt to standardize advertising rules between broadcast, print, and these digital mediums. What does that say, the Honest Ads Act, in a, in a nutshell? It is an effective expansion of existing broadcast regulation to the internet. Um, now, whether the power f to do that really exists is uh, somewhat questionable because you aren't talking about a limited broadcast spectrum anymore. But it does seem as though the political will to put something like that through is there. What would the effect of that be? I mean, so on the one hand, we could say if if government cracks down, it's going to it's going to cripple social media, you know, or the the FOSTA regulations meant a lot of sites were shutting down, um, turning off sections that that sex workers 
used. Um, and so we might say, well, this is going to this is going to destroy everything. But I I guess I could see it. It could also push us in the right direction. Not not in terms of I mean, it's good that these things are being shut down, but the response to them. So like the the sex workers um, launched a federation of Mastodon, which is a decentralized basically Twitter clone that, that you can run on multiple servers that can talk to each other. So it's a, it's a decentralized Twitter um, and moved their conversation there. And that's something that you know you might be able to shut down one instance of it, but it can pop up somewhere else and you could, you could build it in such a way that it couldn't be shut down, that it's fully distributed and they're now back, people are back to talking and there's hundreds of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of posts on it. Um, so it might be that the response to the government going after all these centralized services and saying we're going to regulate you is that people go back to decentralized services that can't be regulated, which I think would be a good thing. Potentially, though I'm not sure those decentralized services are as robust as we might hope for them to be. Um, that SW list um, was recently bumped off of Cloudflare's DDoS protection, which took it down. It may have gotten back up on its feet now. It's back up, but, yeah. Um, well, that's good. What is the SW list again? Is that a white supremacy thing or? No, no. Um, oh, sorry. This <laughs> is uh, a decentralized social network. This is, oh, the, okay. this is the, the Twitter for sex workers. Oh, okay. I thought you said it was called Mastodon. Mastodon is the name of the underlying technology. Ah, okay. So anyone can set up a Mastodon instance. Okay. Um, uh, like a, your own, it's like installing kind of WordPress on your own server, but then it can talk to other instances as well. So, but they're more vulnerable, as you said. Then we might initially expect um, there's a thought that, well, it's decentralized, so it's censorship proof. Uh, you still need the DDoS protection. Um, and I'm sure some of that will be worked out as we go forward. However, the other concern is that this regulation will cement the status of current market dominant platforms. Facebook, YouTube, they've got a lot of legal clout. They've got huge war chests. They can afford to work under some of this proposed regulation. It'll be more costly for them, but they can bear that costs. A new startup cannot. When you're at the three guys in a garage stage, you can't afford a legal team. And I'm concerned that as a result of some of this upcoming regulation, the next Facebook may just be strangled in its crib. It would be like being stuck with MySpace uh, back when, when Zuck was building Facebook in the garage. If MySpace could have had these regulations, we might all be still friends with Tom. Was that his name? The, MySpace Tom? Yeah, yeah, MySpace Tom. Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it's somewhat trite looking back to see proposals to nationalize MySpace. But um, people made that case then, and that it was make, so important make... that it needed to be nationalized. And had that happened, we would still have it. <laughs> and they, I have seen people say it about Facebook too. I mentioned earlier the, the disconnect between the way that Congress responds to um, the revelations of data gathering and mining by uh, American intelligence agencies and Facebook doing it. Um, and a lot of people who are, you know, they rightly are upset about the NSA gathering all of our data, but they're they're upset about Facebook too um, because they see there, there's a lot of like these are basically the same thing. They're, they're widespread surveillance and widespread surveillance is bad. Is that the right way to look at it? Like is it, is it conceptually, does it make sense to think of what Facebook is doing as massive surveillance and should we be worried about it in anything approaching the way that we worry about it when the NSA is doing it? It depends upon what your imagined threat is. Um, if it's this sort of social discipline, you might be more concerned about Facebook. However, as far as we know, Facebook data is not used to, in Snowden's words, put warheads on foreheads. The NSA's data is. So there is a difference there. However, when it comes to how this Facebook data could be used down the road, well, legally, if the NSA wants it, they're likely to be able to get access to it. So the mere fact that it has been collected and made legible 
can be concerning. Why is this all about Facebook? Like Facebook does this stuff and it, it gathers massive amounts of data about us in order to sell ads and that's its business model. But the business model of Google is to gather massive amounts of data about us in order to sell ads. Twitter's business model, they don't gather quite as much data but they gather a ton of data about us in order to sell ads. Is there something – so on the one hand, is, like, is there something technically different about Facebook that makes it creepier? Or is there something culturally different about Facebook that gets people more upset? I think it's the latter. Um, when you think about Google, it's somewhat difficult to connect your use of search or YouTube to Google AdWords or their other advertising properties. When it comes to Facebook, it's all occurring within the same walled garden. You're reading your friends' posts on Facebook. You're also receiving advertisements from Facebook right alongside them. Um, so it's easier to think about it as a data harvesting and advertising entity within a social media space. Whereas when we look at Google, um, the way in which they collect information and then use it to sell ads is more opaque and distributed. Of course, we can't, for the same reason we discussed with MySpace, we can't presume that Facebook will be around forever and their networking effects and all these things. But, but if there's also the the intergenerational element. It's true. I yeah, think it's, kids don't use Facebook. It's what old people do. It's underappreciated that, for the most part, many of us online today all came online at the same time, regardless of our ages. However, as new generations of so-called digital natives emerge. <laughs> um, this, I'm laughing because this, there was this, this going around the office, everyone was using the term digital natives and some of our colleagues were like, digital native, what is that? Digital native. So, so are you, Will is a digital native. Are you a digital native? I, I guess so. Okay. Um, we're not. We're not. I don't no. Mean, on, no. On the border at least. But yeah, Analog it's, native. it's true. M most young people don't want to hang out in the same spaces as their parents. Um, you don't want your parents to see what you're up to with your friends. And I think you will see much more uh, age cohort based segregation between platforms. Why don't um, the, going forward. the youth just learn how to use Facebook's post privacy tools so then they can share their posts only with their friends and their parents can't see it? That's still if, lame. If, if you're, <laughs> and if you're on there, your mom's going to want to be friends with you. Well, she can be friends with you, but you stick her in a group <laughs> and then you say, share with just this group, which is my homies. I, I think, I mean, I, I won't speak for 15 year olds, uh, but but they seem to like more destructive, meaning like Snapchat, right? It, it goes and then goes away. And they like things that are sort of demonstrating their lives so they can film them and send them out to people. That's what, I don't know, uh, that's what the kids are doing. But that, or they're again, all shifting to messaging. That too. But that, but so this all brings up, so I mean, political communication in the next decades is, I mean, we're not going to be able to predict what it is, but it will be the main way that people form their attitudes about almost everything. I mean, they're, they, even the news networks, they're, they're, you know, their median age is whatever, 60 years old or something like that. The, no 23-year-old is going to start watching 7 o'clock news you know, when, in 10 years. They're going to get it through all these other things. So we're gonna, this conversation about how political opinion is formed and the interesting thing is the more it targets, and my, going back to my theory of not having a good theory of the other side, the more you're effectively targeted with just things you already agree with, the more the other side will look completely insane to you. And then this question, I do think that there's something like a fairness doctrine that will be seriously discussed for social media in the next 20 years. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Will. I really couldn't hope to effectively comment on the 20-year horizon of the Fairness Doctrine. I will, however, point to I think one of the most interesting facets of this claim that Facebook has been censoring conservatives or other marginalized viewpoints. Um, the fact that these two women, Diamond and Silk, who are political e-celebrities, they've risen to prominence by streaming themselves discussing Donald Trump. 
were enough of a political concern to the Republican establishment that today they were invited to the Hill as witnesses to discuss how they may have been impacted by certain changes to Facebook's algorithm. That's a deeply bizarre development um, and speaks to a digital culture and digital political life that is increasingly eating real world politics. This, that, that conservatives thinking that they were being censored on Facebook thing, I have wondered about that because so the, the claim is that our pages, our posts on our, our you know, Patriot Nation whatever page aren't getting anywhere near the reach that they used to, so we must be censored. Um, but all of this was happening at the same time that Facebook announced that they were basically reducing the reach of all pages. And so this is this is like one of my pet peeves in this space is that people routinely don't understand how the technology works, have no idea how the platforms work, stumble across something and then think that it affects everyone, right? But they just noticed it for the first time. Maybe it's been going on forever, but they just noticed it for the first time and they assume that it was like directed by some engineer at them. And so then they, they blow up and it's like this grand conspiracy when in fact it's like, no, this was just we, – we changed our policies for everyone six months ago and you just weren't paying attention. You think conservatives are particularly bad at that? I think that by and large, given the demographics, conservatives, um, especially of the, the MAGA sort, are probably considerably less tech savvy. Um, they, they skew older who tend to be less tech savvy. Um, they skew to other demographics that are not going to be as tech savvy. So I think that does – they're probably not as media or online literate as other groups. They also might have more of a persecution complex. Particularly in relation to Bay Area liberals. Um, when the Daily Coast sees that its traffic has tanked after this algorithmic shift, there isn't really a perceived grievance against them on behalf of the, those who run and operate these platforms. When it comes to conservatives, there's already this culture war tribal distance. So I think it's just easier to impute that animus um, whereas it, it wouldn't occur to the operator of a liberal page. So people who use Facebook, they we begin this discussion talking about, you know, well, when we talk about Congress, they don't seem to understand it or, or these things. Uh, if, if someone's going to learn something from this scandal, putting that in scare quotes too, uh, about maybe things they didn't know about Facebook or, you know, but what, what, you know, what should they realize uh, uh, is a lesson from this in terms of Facebook and social media in general? The, the lesson that I frequently look to when these stories come out is that everything is permanent online. Um, and there, if, if I can jump for a moment from the broader Facebook Cambridge Analytica political scandal to an incident in the past week involving some blog posts that Joy Reid may or may not have written about a decade ago. Um, they were dredged up on the Internet Archive. The Library of Congress had some copies. She's claimed that they've been – were hacked or manipulated in some sense. but. It seems as though they just uh, – she attempted to memory hole this stuff and as much as we heard in the hearings with Zuckerberg that, well, when you delete your page, it's, it's gone forever, that may be the case within Facebook servers but anyone you were friends with might have saved a copy of your page or saved screenshots of things you'd posted. Um, and the extent to which everything online is permanent, so long as someone out there it could be the smallest actor in the world, um, wants to retain it, I think that's still underappreciated and will remain underappreciated for a while. I guess looking forward, we're sitting in April right now as we record this. It may come out in May. 
And at the end of the year, we have a congressional election. Um, and then two years later, we're going to have a presidential election. And all of this stuff that, you know, if people are still relitigating the 2016 campaign, they're going to get pretty hysterical about this stuff when it's the control of Congress or the next president. Um, what do you think we, being both the, the American electorate and how we engage with Facebook and Twitter and other things online and then also policymakers should do about these concerns before we get to November? I think we ought to keep a very close eye on how these platforms are used coming into the midterms because all of the incentives to either misuse them in the case of Russia or play up that misuse when it comes to a host of domestic political actors, none of that is changed between 2016 and this coming November. Um, Russia in particular will have every incentive to meddle just enough or even claim that it has meddled just enough that the American government will continue to attempt to hobble its vital tech sector. Those who want to see more regulation of online advertising and even speech will again have every incentive to play up the impacts of bad speech. So policing these sorts of claims and even if it's the cleanest election in history, you'll see a lot of them, becomes a vitally important democratic duty. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.